today we want to have a little talk uh, about the personal piccolo sound that you all want to develop when you're studying the piccolo. Why is this necessary? Um, because we all use and have a natural habit to learn by imitation. That's what we do when we learn our mother tongue and that's what we do normally when we start learning the flute um, or the piccolo and we imitate our teachers or we imitate idols that we have listened to before. And after a while when you mature and when you want to become a professional piccolo or flute player um, you have to leave this childlike models and um, develop your own grown-up personal sound um, and therefore you have to understand that now you have to develop another relation not the relation student teacher but the relation between two um, equal partners that will be you and your instrument talk about partners um, we have to understand that uh, the partner piccolo uh, normally is not visible when we are playing this is a major problem only for us flute players because our instrument is located here and our sight our view goes outside so when you watch this video you can see my instrument but when you play yourself, you cannot see your instrument and that's a, a really a point that you have to consider. Uh, so the um, conjunction between you and the piccolo will be made mostly subconsciously. Um, by touching with your skin the embouchure, which feels like touching a flute, touching with your fingertips uh, the keys which will feel like touching the flute because the fingerings are equal and um, dealing with an amount of air to develop a sound and also the air is not visible so we really have to uh, learn what we are dealing with otherwise there's a big danger to confuse flute playing and piccolo playing because you have such a strong habit with flute playing and this will lay um, a cover about your um, being aware what you are dealing with. So to make that visible again, I show you uh, what difference it is in size when you play a flute or a piccolo. I think in, in your brain this is clear for you, but in your subconsciousness as soon as you touch only um, uh, the fingerings it is no, not clear any longer. Um, the point is, um, your partner in music, the instrument, will only answer or respond to you in the way you want when you approach it with the right attitude correct attitude and um, appropriate attitude. So if you play the piccolo, it can't be repeated often enough. You are playing one octave higher than when you play the flute. So your body has to be prepared much better, much more stable. Uh, you have to um, support all your notes playing one octave higher than your fingerings are. You can't forget that while playing and that's uh, something which has to be trained and has to be respected all the time uh, when you are practicing and performing with your piccolo. Next thing would be that you um, uh, switch on more senses 
than only the tactile senses of the skin and the touching. Um, I know that it's, uh, it's clear that you feel the piccolo, but uh, even more you have to understand that during you feel it, you are aware that it's not flute fingering, it's piccolo fingering. It's not the flute embouchure, it's only half size of the flute embouchure. Therefore, this little edge that we have to hit to produce a sound, it's much closer to our skin and our face than when we play the flute. So the angle touching this edge has to be much more downward in order to produce a proper and clear and resonating sound. Um, for that, I suggest that you install a third eye. <laughs> so you have two eyes, but of course you have much more senses that can act like an eye, as I call it. And uh, my third eye is placed here, in the center of the embouchure and the place of the upper lip, which is extremely sensitive, sensible, I don't know the word, um, meaning physically that you have lots of little fine nerves that can feel extremely well. So if you just try playing uh, and you feel that you can look with this place and see the edge, see the instrument, and um, maybe if you like this um, imagination of having more than two eyes in your body, then you could install even more eyes here and see what you're doing, creating a higher view of everything you do and not only looking uh, in one direction and focusing on the effect what you are doing, but also on the way how you do it. So that would be a very helpful and uh, interesting tool for all of us in order to recognize with which instrument and which character we are dealing with. Now, talking about your personal sound, uh, um, uh, we will soon realize that sound is m m very much created within the resonating body of the particular instrument. In our case, the piccolo has a very small and thin resonating body and it has a, a very small volume inside. You just open your instrument and take a look into the tube you might have an impression how small um, the volume inside is and how little uh, it is supposed to uh, resonate and uh, build a fully grown sound uh, so as we cannot change the instrument and we cannot give the instrument a big resonating body, like for example, as you see on the picture behind me, uh, the grand piano can offer to its player. So you play the grand piano and the body of the instrument is so large that it has a kind of uh, acoustic of its own inside. Um, so we, with the piccolo, we have to add something else and that would be our own body. Um, as we are supposed to form a new unity between instrument and player, uh, of course, we also have to connect this body and our own body. In our body, we find air filled empty room, rooms, like, of course, the chest, the lungs beneath the chest, um, there are even caves and uh, empty rooms in the face behind 
these bones, behind the nose, behind the front here. And not only the empty and air-filled rooms can resonate, but also the whole matter we are built of. Um, you might have felt that yourself when you have played in orchestra and behind you, two rows behind you, the timpani are playing and you feel that through your own body like waves and you feel that your own body um, <coughs> uh, takes over all the frequencies that the timpani are producing and uh, amplify these. So. Um, it's quite natural that um, the frequencies you create by playing will run through your whole body and your body will integrate them and transmit them to the world. So it's uh, not only the empty room, so you don't have to create a very, very wide chest. It is enough if you are aware that you are sounding, your body is sounding and um, that you are transmitting, transporting all the sound that you produce together with your instrument through your whole body and um, through the whole surface of your body which is act acting like a membrane or the surface of the grand piano or of the string instrument with the big wooden surface which is transporting the frequency. So the piccolo and you form a unity which can't be something else than a very special and individual personal unity which will for sure differ from the unity that your teacher and his instrument form. And it's very good to let that sink in that you and your instrument have only one individual perfect sound and that you cannot imitate uh, any other sound from any other idol or teacher. <laughs> with your piccolo um, which is the material it is made from wood mostly grenadilla or cocos or some other exotic wood and um, this is a living material uh, which means uh, water is included um, the wood will have been dried out for many years of course but there's still some water left uh, within following the structure uh, from the growing of the tree um, and when you form a new unity relation to your instrument there's a physical process which is called uh, the playing in of the instrument uh, einspielen in german <laughs> And physically that means um, that if you see this piece of wood um, there will be originally when the tree is cut there will be uh, water in between all these layers because uh, during the life of the tree of course it needed the water to grow and to live. Um, and um, the water runs in special kind of veins <laughs> or lines and then when you cut it and dry it out it is shrinking and now when you play it as an instrument um, the water within will react to the frequencies you play it will be um, become a new order it follows the order and the structure of the frequencies. So when you play um, 
the first, the second and the third October you uh, will create a new order of water and wood fibers within the wood. Um, and you need to repeat that a lot because it, it needs time to create that new order. And when it is uh, um, fully developed, then the piccolo and the wood will answer to every frequency, to every note you play um, most perfectly. And if you stop playing and uh, the instrument will be in the cupboard for half a year, the order um, is dissolving <laughs> and vanishes. So that's why uh, when you um, not play the instrument for a long time, you need to repeat that process of playing in um, again. So it's a kind of natural order that you are creating. Um, this needs to be respected. This means for you, you can only create your personal sound when you touch every note every day with the piccolo. Don't avoid difficult notes because they will not answer you if you do not give them the chance to create that order of water and fiber. Um, so you need to practice the third octave of the highest and the lowest notes and discover what they need to um, unfold. <laughs> important uh, difference between our two instruments piccolo and flute is that the flute has been reconstructed in the 19th century and um, the purpose was to make the scale more equal and the response of the fingerings and the uh, every single note um, more equal and more easygoing and our piccolo didn't fo follow that development. Um, it received the same key, mechanical, but it did not receive uh, the same tube. Um, the flute has a cylindric tube, same size here and there. And the piccolo kept the conical tube, bigger here, smaller here, which is the construction of the transverse flute, the old flutes that were used in the Baroque. So we have um, to treat um, our pressure and our air stream differently now from the flute. And uh, it can't be repeated often enough uh, that you can't play this piccolo with as much pressure and strength of airstream like the flute. Uh, um, it can't deal with it. <laughs> because uh, you can easily imagine if you just take a look through this little tube and see that tunnel, how small is that and how, under what pressure the air gets when it's starting here. And now it is on its way through this tunnel, ending up here and here. Um, it will be much, much smaller. So consider that the pressure you give in here will be much higher here. Um, so you have to make different plans <laughs> when you play notes um, with a long fingering like E, D or D sharp or even F. Uh, all these long fingerings when you cover the whole tube of the, of the piccolo uh, can't cope with too much pressure and produce easily the famous piccolo cracks. So it's again, it's very, very important that you respect that and don't want to force it um, and don't to mix it up with the kind of treatment that you can give the flute. It must be the personal piccolo treatment um, and if you dive in even more into that topic, you will find out that even every single fingering on the piccolo needs a individual treatment, an individual um, uh, attitude 
to respond naturally and free. Um, so I need a different uh, airstream tempo for every single octave on the piccolo. Um, the slowest air in the low register, um, still very sweet and calm air in the second octava and very, very uh, individual doses of uh, air tempo in the third octava where um, an E can be much more easygoing than an F sharp, a G again more easygoing than a G sharp, the A again more easygoing than his uh, um, the sound uh, beside it. So that uh, the uh, airstream will go like a zigzag curve and not like a line upwards like you are used to when you play a chromatic line upwards on the flute. Um, so that will be up to you to discover what treatment your own piccolo uh, needs for every fingering and this will form in the end your personal relation to your instrument. Don't be angry about that. It is like it is. Um, you can't expect a, a friendly answer from your instrument if you uh, don't speak in the correct language or energy. <laughs> so it's uh, very important to welcome also the difficult approaches and the difficult attack um, on notes like G sharp in the third octava. If you don't welcome it, uh, the relation will be under tension and under pressure and negative energy. Um, but if you just say, yes, I know you need, um, uh, it's not an evil sound, <laughs> it, it just needs uh, quicker air, that's all. So uh, you have to regard it in a neutral way, just, um, just noticing, not judging, which is the basic for every relation you form in life. If you want to have a good relation to a difficult person, just welcome his ways and give him or her what he needs to be easygoing and then the relation will blossom. And same to our little devil here <laughs> and the third octava. between the person and the instrument to have a perfect match and a perfect personal sound in the end. Of course, we have uh, to answer the question, who is my uh, future partner? What instrument will be my future instrument? So when you buy a new piccolo, um, you will have to decide um, which one is my future partner? <laughs> um, you, perhaps before you buy the piccolo, um, make up your mind if you want a, um, yeah, what kind of player are you? Do you are you a sweet and intimate player? Um, are you a very straightforward and powerful player? Um, what intentions do you have? What expectations do you have from your instrument and your future playing? And in what circumstances will you need the instrument? Will you play a lot outdoor, like in a marching band, or will you be a, a teacher uh, and play the instrument just for playing literature, like uh, piccolo sonatas? Um, or will you be an orchestra playing and then uh, what kind of orchestra are you playing in? Is this a uh, um, famous uh, top of the world, um, very strong playing orchestra or some uh, orchestra out of uh, only Diletti? <laughs> um, and 
con collect all these uh, facts and then make up your mind what you are looking for. That's very important. Uh, next topic would be um, do not change, uh, choose the instrument which is uh, uh, most easy going because maybe you can't um, form an interesting relation on an instrument which is just uh, responding to anything you would do with it. Um, that would be an, um, a follower only, <laughs> only a follower and not a partner. Understand what I mean? So if you want to have a really nice and um, uh, full partnership, you need an instrument which needs uh, to be discovered who it is. So take your time. Don't choose the instrument the first day in the shop, but take it home and try the instrument in different situations, in different rooms, and understand how it the relation between you and the instrument is working in different situations and in situations that you know, the acoustic that you know at home or in the concert room or in the music school or uh, in relation to the sound in with your teacher. So, <clears throat> so take your time and consider that also the one chooses the wizard so if you don't um, if your perspective will only be what do i want from the instrument what do i demand uh, then you will not consider that maybe the instrument will need something from you so or again take your time and listen what the instrument is asking and uh, give the right answers, give the personal answers to your piccolo and uh, um, take your time to discover what language the piccolo needs to develop its own full sound. And only then, if you both understand each other, then you will find your personal sound and your personal relationship to the um, piccolo you have chosen and you will have really fun and uh, um, fulfillment in music in your future. So I hope that was a bit helpful for you and um, I'm looking forward to listen to you uh, in the future and find your YouTube videos and your performances in the musical world later. All the best to you and bye-bye.